I hope you're ready for another great week of business statistics with your instructor, Dr. Todd Day. Before this next section, I, I want to uh, reintroduce you to Dr. Edward Tufte, who wrote the book Visual Display of Quantitative Information. I happen to have a copy because I went to one of his seminars and we all got a copy of all of his books. And this has been just a wonderful book with multiple displays of data, not just bar charts and line charts, but data that is displayed in, in various ways, in creative ways, uh, as well as some that data that's not being displayed well at all. So on page 13, which is really the first page of the first chapter, is a chapter called Graphical Excellence. And here's what Dr. Tufte writes about display of data. Excellence in statistical graphics consists of complex ideas communicated with clarity, precision, and efficiency. And he goes on to list the qualities of good data display. He says that graphics reveal data. The whole point of creating a chart is so that we can reveal something within the data. Are the data revealed honestly, without distortion and focusing on substance? No chart junk, no little additions like 3D charts or other additions that, that really distort or don't add to the display of data. Synopsizing lots of data, taking a huge data set and presenting it very simply in a tidy little summary, which is supported in the text description. Does what you say in the text match up with what we see in the chart? And the purpose then should be to stimulate thought. We look at this chart, and we think about what these data mean. We spot an outlier, or we see a relationship that wasn't clear at the outset. That is the sign of good data display. The most important thing that we should do with data is to display it honestly. And I want to walk you through an example of a project that I was involved in. So this was a study using a program called Choosing the Best, and it was part of an abstinence-only sex education program. And the abstinence-only idea, it's the just say no of sex education. Does this work? When I first was given these data points, uh, I wanted to know, does it work? And I was assured that this is, in fact, an evidence-based program. And so I said, show me the evidence. And the first thing that I noticed was they had only one bit of evidence, and it was this bar chart, in which they say that students who received Choosing the Best were nearly 1.5 times more likely to delay the onset of sexual behavior than the control students at the end of ninth grade. Well, that looks like a pretty impressive outcome. If you look at the height difference between those bars, it's pretty dramatic. And so you might think, that's some pretty good evidence. That shows that this program is working. But I immediately recognized a few things about this display of data that made me suspicious. Number one, the y-axis is not anchored at zero. When we have percentages, which run from zero to 100, but we start in the middle of the range of percentages, that can magnify the size of the difference between the bars. In fact, if you look at the size of the difference between these bars, here's our control group, we'll just consider that as one. What would be 1.5? I represented it with a blue bar, a darker blue bar, that's the height of 1.5. And yet this lighter blue bar is 2.5 times taller than the green bar, even though in the text it says there was a 1.5 times difference between these bars. And the third thing that I noticed, just from reading the rest of the text, was that there was a pretest and a post-test and a follow-up, and yet I'm only given the data for the post-test. Well, this matters because if we have repeated measures or time series data, we need to know how the groups started and how they ended. So for example, if we were running a race and I show you the photo finish at the end of the race and there's one person who is clearly crossing the finish line first 
and the second person is one stride behind the first place finisher. So clearly you know who came in first, who came in second, who was the fastest runner. But that assumes that everyone started from the same starting line. If everyone is all in a line and they all run that 100 yard distance, that photo finish tells us something important. But if we find out that one of the runners, the one who came in second place, actually started 10 feet behind the line that everyone else was starting at. And at the end of the race, we do have one person crossing the line first. That second place runner who's one stride behind actually had to run 10 feet further than the other runners. Does that change the way you interpret that finish, knowing that they didn't start at the same place? If we have repeated measures data, to display them honestly, we need to know the beginning and the end, not just how they looked at the end. So I took the actual data from the report and created new bar charts that I think display the data much more accurately. Number one, I anchored the y-axis at zero. Everyone has the same starting point. Now, the difference that's displayed in our first bar chart is right there. And you'll notice that the magnitude of that difference isn't nearly what it appears to be in our first bar chart. It's actually fairly modest. Then I looked at the pre, post, and follow-up to see what was the pattern. Now this was a study that was done at the end of ninth grade. We have a group of students who go through a, a two or three week program and at the end of that program, we see an increase in the outcome variable. So imagine that in January, I, I say, I've got this new program. Uh, it is all about a new year and a new you. And this year you can get in shape and lose weight and feel better and be healthy. I could do a program and in a very short time see a huge increase in the number of people who say, yes, I want to get healthy. But if I follow them out for three months, does my initial program have a lasting effect? Is it a robust effect that lasts for more than just the immediate time in which the program is delivered? Can it last over three months? So I track this with our pre, post, and follow-up, and what we find is these two lines are parallel. That means that they are changing at the same rate. They are decreasing, and we can measure that decrease. It's 11.3%. Now you will notice that in the pretest, the green bar started higher than the blue bar, and at the post-test, that green bar was lower. That difference is really what they should have been crowing about, because that shows a dramatic effect at least immediately after the program. But when we follow them out over summer break, and when they return in the fall, well, we see a decrease of 11.3% in both groups. So if you accept the idea that decreases are not a success, in other words, success is measured by a bar that stays constant and doesn't change, and we see both of the programs are failing at the same rate. Which, of course, is not the outcome that the people who created the program necessarily wanted to hear about, but it's the outcome that the data actually reveal. Let's summarize everything that we've learned about how to choose a chart. What's the best advice for how to use all of our options? Bar charts are used to show either frequency, which are counts, or percentages. And they're used with categorical data. We notice that in the bar chart, the bars do not touch because they are indicating that these categories are unrelated. We could easily reorganize them and it wouldn't change anything about what's being revealed in the data. In fact, it might actually make it easier to interpret. Histograms look a lot like bar charts, except in a histogram, the bars in the histogram touch, indicating the continuous nature of this quantitative data, that one and two and three and four need to stay in that order because they are connected or related. A stem and leaf display, this is something that is often used behind the scenes, not necessarily published, 
it gives us the best of both. In other words, we can still see the shape of the data as we can with a histogram, and we can preserve the actual raw scores that we would see in a frequency table. So our stem and leaf display is for quantitative data, continuous scale data, where we can preserve both the raw scores and see the shape. When we have two variables and want to compare between them, we can use a stacked bar chart. This is going to compare typically a frequency, a percent frequency, uh, although we could use the relative frequency, within categorical data. This is the one where the bars add up to 100%. The alternative to the stacked bar is the side-by-side -side bar chart, which is also used with categorical data, but used more particularly when we're comparing to a continuous variable. Now we can see those percentages, and we can look within each category. And the last type of analysis we looked at was the scatter plot. This is used to explore relationships between two scale level or quantitative variables. So our scatter plot is showing us this relationship. The regression line approximates that relationship in a straight line. That's the line that we could use for making predictions. So let me show you this way of displaying data just as a review. So remember data, we learned two general categories. First of all, we could have categorical or quantitative data, or we could have continuous or quantitative data. For our categorical data, the options that we could choose in, as, our, as we're showing the distribution would be we could display them as simple frequencies, which are also known as counts. We could use relative frequency or percent frequency. If we want to put them into a table so we can make comparisons, we would use cross tabulation. For graphs, our options are the bar chart or the pie chart. And if we want to make comparisons, we could use either the stacked bar chart or the side by side bar chart. The bold lettering indicates my advice for the best way to display these level of data. So for instance, you, if you're creating a table, uh, I would recommend using your count data and your percent frequency. And then you would display your categorical data in a bar chart. Well, what are the options for continuous or scale level data? Putting them into a table, we could use simple frequency, but if we use simple frequency, we tend to put them into bins, where we take 1 to 5 and 6 to 10 and so on. We could also report relative frequency, percent frequency, or cumulative frequency where we add up the total and when we get to the top of the cumulative frequency part of the table, we have a total that adds up to the same as the sample size. For making comparisons, we would still use cross tabulation. We could use that between a categorical and a binned continuous variable or two binned continuous variables. The options for graphs are the histogram, dot plot, stem and leaf. If you're going to be doing any publication or just writing a report, histograms are really the way to go with continuous data, and you have the most flexibility for creating graphs using the percent frequency for your continuous data. The final option would be for exploring relationships between continuous data, and that's where we use a scatter plot. Well, that's what we have to cover this week about taking two variables and displaying them both together in a way that helps us to either explore relationships or display the data in a way that we can make comparisons. Do you have any questions before we wrap up the lecture today? Well, thank you so much for being here, and I will see you guys next week.